you for joining me for another episode of Bradford's Garage. Today's episode, we're going to be building the short block for the aluminum 3-valve 4.6 that I put into this new edge. I had Livernoy Motorsports clean and deck the block and then hone the cylinders to fit my new pistons. The first thing I did in this process was to file fit the rings to set the ring gaps. So using the chart provided with my pistons, I calculated the size of the ring gaps that I needed for the top and second rings. They also provide a diagram to show you proper orientation of the rings when installing them on the pistons. If you've never filed rings before, it can be a slightly tedious process that requires a lot of patience. My advice is just to settle in and let it take as long as it takes. One of these manual hand crank ring filers is a great place to start as opposed to one of the more expensive motorized units. It does take a little bit more elbow grease and a little bit more time to do it this way, but with the motorized units you can quickly remove too much material and overshoot the gap and end up needing to buy a new set of rings. So in getting used to this process, I think the hand filer is the way to go. You want your feeler gauge to slip into the gap without too much pressure, but definitely not just wiggle around in there either. You're also looking for the ring ends to be nice and square to each other to have a nice even gap from the outside to the inside edge. I tagged each ring pack and weighed it and then set them aside and moved on to the connecting rods. To balance connecting rods, you need a connecting rod balancing jig and a high precision scale. The first thing I did was weigh the big end of all of the connecting rods. Noted which one was the lightest, and then proceeded to remove material from the rest to try and match that weight. Once the big end weights were all matched, I laid the whole connecting rod on a scale to help me determine what to remove from the small end to balance out the overall weight. Next, I weight matched the pistons. Also mention here that if you're interested in learning these techniques in more detail than what I'm providing here in this video, um, there's a company called HP Academy. Um, I believe they're out of New Zealand and they do a really, really great job of explaining these things. They have online courses that you can purchase. They're really reasonably priced. Um, the content quality is excellent and I highly recommend it. So what I'm doing here is just removing some material um, from the underside of the piston along the corner of the skirt and underneath the uh, wrist pin boss with a carbide burr. Just um, trying to take off some weight and match it to the lightest piston. What I found worked really well was to get it within a couple tenths of a gram with the carbide burr and um, because that leaves a little bit of a rougher finish I would come back in with a Dremel and a little 220 grit flap wheel and just try to polish and smooth everything out um, to take the remaining amount of weight off of the piston and usually that put me right about where I wanted to be. With all the components weight matched I dropped a full assembly and the crankshaft off at the machine shop for crank balancing. So the crank's now off at the balance shop and it's time to deburr and prep the block for assembly. On the top side of the engine, I just focused on breaking any of the sharp corners left behind by the decking process and remove any burrs in the water jackets or the oil passages. 
bottom end, I removed any sharp corners or burrs from the main webbing, as well as the oil pan rails and around the oil drain back holes to make sure that any of the oil coming from the top end back into the oil pan would be completely unobstructed and free flowing. and also knock the sharp corner off the bottom of the cylinder sleeves. After deburring, I gave the block a good thorough wash with the pressure washer, making sure to remove all the metal shavings and debris from the oil galleries and the water jackets. I then thoroughly dried the block and blew out all the oil passages and water jackets with compressed air, made sure all the water was out of the bolt holes for the mains, as well as wiped down the main bearing surfaces with a rag and a little bit of brake clean. Then installed the main bearings in the block and in the caps. On this engine build, I did not go with ARP bolts. I actually used the OEM uh, torque to yield bolts. I bought new ones, obviously. I didn't reuse the old ones, but I did go torque to yield on these just because there's a lot of added cost when you go to an ARP bolt that some people don't really realize. Um, with the additional clamping force of the high strength bolts, such as an ARP, it is generally a good idea um, to have the mains align honed as the additional clamping force can sometimes distort uh, the main bearing housing, which could lead to a whole lot of problems for you. So rather than spending the additional money on the bolts and the machine work, I went with the torque to yield bolts from the factory because the bottom end of these blocks is usually pretty good. And knowing this build was probably only gonna make about 400 horsepower with no power adder, I did feel comfortable just going with the stock bolts. I know of a lot of guys who track these cars regularly with stock internals and um, the bottom end of these engines is not the weak point. If anything, it is the valve train and so that's why I made the decision to allocate my budget toward valve train upgrades and uh, the GT500 oiling system. The main bearings are installed under the engine block and all the bolts are torqued and as you can see without a crankshaft. The reason is we're gonna check oil clearance. So we measure each main journal with a micrometer and we're going to use a dial bore gauge to measure the difference between the inside of the micrometer and the inside of the main bearing bore. Zero out the dial bore gauge inside the micrometers and then take a measurement inside the bore. The difference between the two readings is the amount of oil clearance you have. So after taking all of my readings, you can see here that the clearances were pretty tight. And this is where the story gets a little bit interesting. So when I initially tore the engine down, I found that the crankshaft was showing some wear. Um, there was some light scoring on the journals, but enough that I took it to a machine shop to have the journals actually ground down to like 10 thousandths undersized. So I dropped the crank off and I ordered new bearings for the rods and the mains. When I got the crank back, the size was okay, but as you could see in the clip where I was measuring the journals with the micrometer, um, they kind of burned the journals a little bit. They, it looked like they got pretty hot. They didn't look very good, that's for sure. So when I got my bearings and I installed them into the block and then I got the crank back and I started measuring for the clearances, what I found is that the housing in the block was actually on the smaller side and they left the crankshaft on the larger side of the window. So when the tolerance is stacked up, I ended up with like seven ten thousandths of an inch of oil clearance on one of the journals. And the biggest one was one and three tenths, um, which is definitely not gonna work. I mean, one and three tenths is 
pretty small. Ideally, I was hoping to find right around two thousandths, but anywhere from like one and eight tenths to two and three, two and four tenths, I would have been pretty happy with. So I called the machine shop and I talked to the owner and he agreed that maybe we could just dust a little bit off of the journals to get my clearances where I wanted them. Well, I dropped it off and within a few days, they called me back and said they weren't gonna be able to do that. It just wasn't enough material to try and remove. Um, to get everything dialed in. They recommended that we take it down to 20 thousandths, which I didn't want to do because I'd have to order new bearings, but that was fine. I took their recommendation. Well, when I got the crankshaft back the second time, the journals looked even worse. It looked like maybe they didn't dress the grinding stone before they started. They were chattered up just looked like absolute crap. I was pretty unhappy. I let him know. He agreed. He looked at the photos and said, yeah, it never should have gone out that way. We'll give you your money back and I'll even refund you the money that you spent on bearings. So I got my money back. I got money for the bearings. And what I ended up doing was ordering a new crankshaft from Ford. The reason I went with the Ford crankshaft is that the stock crankshaft in these engines is actually really good and it's lighter weight than any of the aftermarket cast uh, steel units. I knew I didn't want to go forged because I wasn't going to spend the money on it. It wasn't necessary for this build. And I also just wanted to keep the weight of the rotating assembly down. An additional advantage of going back to standard size main and rod journals is that when your bearings are in standard size, you can generally order the bearings in plus one thousandths or minus one thousandths. So I could really dial in the oil clearances if I needed to. I ordered up Clevite rod and main bearings. When I reassembled the engine and the rods with the standard size bearings and compared it to the crankshaft journals, everything checked out to be just where I wanted it. 
had the crankshaft in the block, I could start matching rod assemblies to journals on the crankshaft. Since the crankshaft journals and the rods are going to vary by a couple tenths here and there, it's best to measure them all individually and try to match them up to each other according to size. the rod bolts, Eagle calls for a special molly grease to be applied to the threads and underneath the bolt heads. The method I'm going to use to torque the rod bolts is going to be by stretch. So here I'm putting the stretch gauge on the rod bolt and noting its free length on the side of the rod. It's more accurate to torque a bolt to stretch rather than to torque as torque wrenches can fall out of calibration. When I mic'd out the crankshaft, I found that I had three journals that measured all the same, and the journal for two and six measured two tenths smaller. So I zeroed the bore gauge at the larger journals and measured the big end of all of the connecting rods. I ended up with two connecting rods that measured a little bit smaller than the others, which worked out perfectly in this case. I just paired them with the pistons for cylinders two and six. Next, I loosened all of the rod bolts and took another measurement with the stretch gauge to make sure that they all returned to their original free length. This assembly uses a floating wrist pin, which means that it can move freely inside the small end bore of the connecting rod as well as the bore and the piston, and circlips on each end of the wrist pin hold it in place. So now we can install the rings with just a light coating of 30 weight oil. Anything thicker or heavier than oil can keep the rings from moving freely in the ring grooves and functioning properly. The oil control rings are pretty thin and flimsy and can easily be spiraled onto the piston without damaging them, but for the compression rings it's best to use a ring spreader. Also note any markings, bevels, or steps in the rings and make sure that you've got the orientation correct. Once installed, make sure they move freely in the grooves. Next we thoroughly wipe down the cylinder bores in preparation for installing the pistons. I used a little bit of brake clean on a rag. You could also use transmission fluid as it contains a detergent and actually works pretty well. The key here is you want to keep wiping each cylinder until there is no more black coming out on the rag that you're using. The black that you're wiping out is actually dust from the honing process that is still packed into the cross hatching. If this is not removed entirely, it can affect the break-in process on your rings. Once clean, I applied a light coating of 30 weight oil to the cylinder walls. And now we can install the pistons and rods into the block. There are a few different types of ring compressors you could use when installing pistons. On this build, I decided to splurge and go with the billet aluminum sleeve, and I gotta say, I will never go back to using the band clamps. 
With all the pistons and rods installed, we can torque the rod bolts. Through the process of measuring for my oil clearances, I had found a setting on my torque wrench that consistently gave me the correct amount of stretch. So I didn't end up checking bolt stretch once they were installed into the engine, just torque them to that setting. Using a dial indicator, I found the highest point of the piston, and with a straight edge laid across the deck and some feeler gauges, I measured the piston to deck clearance. And then lastly installed the GT500 oil pump, pickup tube, windage tray, and oil pan. And with that, the short block was complete. Well guys, that's gonna do it for this episode. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, if you found it useful, let me know down in the comments. Give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video. We're gonna wrap this series and wrap up this engine build by installing the heads and degreeing the camshafts. So thanks again, we'll see you next time.